This America, man. If you walk through the garden, you better watch your back. Well, I beg your pardon, want to stay in there. No matter who's putting it out there, the moralizing over the intent of an artist versus the audience's interpretation is grating and idiotic. It does not matter if it's the Christian right of Reagan through Bush screaming about depictions of sex and drug use, or NYU educated journalists doing the same towards depictions of racism or personal misconduct. It's either the end zone dance of a politically dominant group who does not want you to even feel escapism, or one that feels insecure themselves. They do not totally control culture as they do government, or it is the job of busybody losers who have abandoned the idea of political power in favor of cultural dominance. Both equate depiction with endorsement, and the political affiliation of whatever work with all the problems in the world. I also had to keep reminding myself all this while watching The Wire. I consider The Wire the lowest of the big three prestige shows below The Sopranos and Deadwood, and I think I may evaluate it on a lower scale than its two counterparts, specifically because of its grounding in recent liberalism, as opposed to grand narratives of decline in community. Perhaps we can't give an, a, an objective evaluation of this show for that reason, but I firmly believe the only thing that has aged worse from this troika is The Sopranos' first season. That is not to say that this is a bad show. It's better than the vast majority of very good and great shows. It's innovative in a number of ways, has wonderful characterization and storylines, but while viewing it, you are very much aware of the time it was made in and who made it. That said, I think The Wire won out in the end. Shows made now resemble it far more than they do other prestige of years past. The culture victors live to tell the tale, Everyone else, you can just talk about how great they were and how they'll never be replicated, and you'll be right. Watching this, uh, watching The Wire again, uh, I, I felt about the same of it as I did when I watched it the first time. Like, I, I, I think the look of it is very well done. They, For how dated the show feels, writing-wise, uh, just looks-wise, it doesn't look bad. Like in the way that Sopranos season one looks bad in a very specific late nineties way, the wire does not. Right. Everything is grimy without being too overdone in sort of a dark night way. Uh, everything has sort of the right degree of shittiness mixed with like visually pleasing shots and it, everything is cut together quite well. And it definitely fits with what this show is, which is, a procedural about bureaucracy more than it is anything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like a meta procedural. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like instead of the procedure of a specific case, the procedure of the cases, like generally, you know, the process of making the cases, the sausage being made. Exactly. Yeah. While watching it, I felt like, I felt like it had a lot more in common with Gossip Girl mm. than it did like Deadwood because it is, in the same way that Gossip Girl is about social procedure and, like, who, who you need to know to get in here. And if you know this guy, you can go to this party. In the same way that it's similar to Mean Girls, uh, this is similar to both those things. The Wire is similar to both those things because so many, like, I, I remember this from when I first watched it. But so many episodes are like, all right, McNulty has to get this done by this guy so we can get Rawls to, do, to talk to this guy. And then they can get them to sign off on a fucking wiretap. And it, they mirror that in the Barksdale organization and uh, the docs to a lesser extent. And I kind of, I really like that, actually. Yeah, it keeps it uh, zipping around. There's always, there's always incident, which is, uh, it's good. Because, like, you know, there's like, there's the three things that are in these things broadly. You've got, you know, the, uh, the sort of the directly th thematic content which there's a lot of in this show and then you've got the plot like the actual just 
you know, uh, the crime story stuff and the procedural minutia within it, and then the characterization. And uh, Wire is a show that is is unique, I think, among the big three, and that it it, it puts the mo- least emphasis on character and the most then on theme and uh, and plot. Yeah, the characterization I would describe it as efficient. Yeah, and I think that is definitely the way shows are now. Like th- the the ratio of those three things uh, after uh, the wire, and then def- and uh, it it definitely shifted uh, away uh, towards like away from having like really well defined characters. Yeah, the wire. I don't think the wire was. I mean, first of all, it would be kind of impossible for them to make it this way even though they did exist at the time but the wires characterization methods pre-sage shows whose characters and dialogue and actions were pre-made to be made into viral moments or gifts yeah like i think it i think about the i think about wendell pierce's character oh yeah no moreland oh god yeah. i the one thing that we really were saved uh cosmically is that Twitter wasn't there when people were really getting into the wire. Media people. Oh my media god. Media people were really getting into the wire because it, it flew under the radar for its first two or three seasons. And then it had a breakout fourth season. Uh which oh God. Just just in in the far less like super saturating cultural space of the pre free social media era, I just remember the the memification of uh that show and if the fucking twitter had been there for all the blue check people to be doing like that's right i'm natural born police oh yeah i want to uh i want to get into the wire and cringe later on in this episode yes, because it's there's a lot a of that deep conversation to be had about that but it, it it yeah no it was not a huge deal for the first two seasons like i you would see people talk about it as a great show but it was season four where it really blew up Yes. Um, like the first season I think is very good and the first season is very much like this was made by people who wrote Homicide wrote yeah. shows like that there's even overlapping characters between Homicide Life on the Streets and The, uh, and the Wire mm-hmm. it's it, kind of interesting if you're into that sort of thing if you love yeah, shows yeah the extended as as Baltimore us. PD universe <laughs> yeah, I can't wait till we get the Dundalk spinoff <laughs> <laughs> hell yeah Um. so like they're doing the same thing they would do with procedural crime shows, but for following a bureaucracy, as yeah. we said. And I think people really like that. Like, it definitely had its core of audience. And it was sort of about social issues of crime and poverty as well. Uh, but it was more this procedural show. Like, the docs is when they started trying to explore broader issues as season themes. Uh, like season one is about the Barksdale organization. It's about Avon Barksdale, who's a composite character of several Baltimore and DC drug dealers. Um, season two is about the people who deal with the importation of drugs, a union that works on the docks. Uh, they're the, fir- they're the only like largely white criminals who yeah. we survey the entire series. Yes. They're the, uh, they're those white working class guys you hear about. Yeah. And season two is like, I've heard people try to be contrarians by going, oh, that's the best season, but it's not, <laughs> it's very much not No, like season, season two has a lot of like Sarconian cringe. Yeah. Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Where it's like the head of the, the dock workers union who is, you know, importing humans and cocaine yeah. and all this shit, uh, just so his union will have enough money and the docks can say a thing. Gotta dredge the harbor. Yeah. The, he, he'll just like outright say things like this country used to make things. Yeah. Build now shit. Make- now we yeah. just pick each other's pockets. Yeah. And it's just like some subtlety. Please. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I kept wanting while watching this. Just can you not like yeah. just directly Hit the back on the row. fucking head. Just yeah. Do you got do you got to just belt it out like that or at ever at, at that level at that volume the entire time yeah you know how we were talking about um with the shield uh the the restrained versus unrestrained nature of the showrunner and writer yes and how um when they're restrained their biggest excesses are like they're like spices that are used to the exact right degree you, yeah you, you there's some a lot there of it to keep it keep it down to keep the palate rounded 
but you don't want you know you don't want you don't want uh, your meal to be half coriander yeah exactly the wire has enough coriander sometimes it's a little much it's a little too much like someone just saying the atlantic subheader out loud this is america uh, man <laughs> oh god yeah um uh, but for the most part, it works, and it's still like a very watchable, great show. But then when you watch Treme, which was David Simon's uh, thing after yes. the wire, where he was unrestrained, Bots are the, asleep post rare Tremes. Yeah, Treme was an exceeding exercise in posting cringe. Uh, it's I was never able to bring myself to watch it. I felt guilty about that for a while because I, at that point, you know, when I saw it as a younger man, I really loved the wire. But uh, like every schmuck, but man, uh, I could never get into Treme. I don't think anyone could. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> didn't go on very long. Yeah. Uh, there, Treme you was got to get out there, and blow that hole. <laughs> that's what it was. It was Billy Crystal Jazz Man, like <laughs> a liquor it, stick. It, it was so fucking embarrassing because David Simon. It was they were like, "All right, David, you did the wire. What do you want to do next?" And he's like, "The most embarrassing thing ever." HBO's uh, we got you, buddy. Actually, that's not a rare occurrence. How did David Milch finish his uh, career best work uh, with Deadwood? When they, it's like, sorry, buddy, uh, Deadwood's done, but we'll give you another show. He made John in Cincinnati. <laughs> John in Cincinnati. I maybe for our twenty first secret episode, we can do John in Cincinnati. I am upset. I've seen every episode of that multiple times. It's like it's. I think if. They ever want us to do like a bonus bonus? Mm -hmm. We should do John Cincinnati because it's such a great. It's one of those lost shitty prestige shows yeah. that just didn't have. It's a very interesting shitty show to me, and I feel the same way about John Cincinnati as I do about those high budget Christian movies we watch. Right, yeah. Where it's like this is so interesting what you were going for. Yeah, but, right. But to get back to Simon and Treme, uh, in Treme there is a part where. Um, this like white nerd who is a music teacher, uh, he gets like all these black musicians in a recording studio to record a song called "Shame on You, W." <laughs> God damn! <laughs> and that's that's what the dog does without a leash. Holy that's what David shit. Simon does when that, you don't leash. That him. is that's buck wild. Yeah, he went crazy. Yeah. He went crazy with that. Yeah. It's it's a collaborative medium, David. It's not really like film. <laughs> yeah. Take some notes. <laughs> yeah, that there's like a director of the song. Yeah. Like, oh god, it's <laughs> it, it sucked. Um but used it used sparingly and used it a collaborative method collaborative nature with other people, with people who had yeah, made homicide, made all these other things. It, you still had so much of that procedural and bureaucratic element that it was still a great show. And I, I think that Simon cringe, like, I think it attracted a lot of people because, it, it, like, okay, so season three that happens after season two, and I think the worst seasons are season five and then season two. But season three is an Iraq war allegory. And it's about... The, the budding uh, Marlowe Stanfield organization going up against the Barksdale organization. And there is, you know, there are hits and reprisals and robberies and they do the same like procedural like, okay, we got to, uh, you know, get the wire trap down thing that they always do. But there are these asides like uh, Slim Charles, who's sort of like the, the paramilitary commander of the Barksdale organization. Uh, he's talking with Avon and they're about to hit, try to hit Stanfield's crew. It ends up being a, a failed attempt. And they go, "Why are we in this war? You know, what was it for? Was it for a lie?" <laughs> and then they go, uh, Barksdale goes, it "Doesn't matter if it was a lie. We're in it now." And yeah, like, and he goes, "Oh, I wonder what this is about." Yeah, he goes, "You go to war on that lie. <laughs> you go to. It's like, oh, war, lying, lying, and going into a war, huh? Yeah, makes you think about things." Yeah, season three is also where I feel like they started to take a hold with more fan favorite characters. Uh, uh, we'll get into Omar in oh, a yes. second. The, the breakout but, star. Omar was a breakout star, but Stringer Bell was a big breakout star. Yes, he was. He was. That's true. Considering it's, you often forget that he died in the third season, he didn't even it wasn't in like 
two fifths of the show. Yeah, there really isn't that much Stringer Bell, and people still love that character. In Stringer Bell, he was the sort of money man in the Barksdale organization, and they there are some funny scenes with Stringer. Like he tries when they have the meeting of the of yeah. the dealers and captains. Uh, Stringer tries to get them to follow Robert's rules of order. Yeah, um, that was funny. Yeah, You're taking there's... notes on a criminal fucking conspiracy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was a funny scene. Uh, they have him. He goes to a community college macroeconomic class, which is, I don't know how much that would help you. Is well, Stringer has ambitions of being a real estate developer and gets conned in that. Yeah, I got all. Which I, I, I did like that storyline. I thought that was, you know, perfect wire bureaucracy function. But, yeah. uh, yeah, and, and he gets conned by Clay Davis, uh, the scumbag Democratic state senator in the show. And uh, this is another, like, uncharacteristically like funny thing for the wire where stringer is like oh i can i'm just gonna kill the state senator <laughs> yep <laughs> just gonna murk this motherfucker yeah and slim charles is like no <laughs> i'm not doing that uh but uh yeah no i always wondered why he was taking community college macro econ because it's like it, whether you're trying to be a drug dealer or a real estate developer you're not are you going to talk about the impossible currency triangle? <laughs> like, well, I think it's wrong class. I think that that's just is supposed to show that he doesn't really know what he's doing. It's sort of, I think it's yeah, supposed yeah. to maybe presage that he gets rooked because you find that out. Yeah. first. It's like, he's doing all these plans while he's taking this class. And then, and that's like, Oh, he doesn't actually have like the background to do this. You know, he, yeah, he, yeah. he, he, cause he doesn't know what he doesn't know. And, that like really does speak to like the way that like you know uh, injustice gets entrenched uh, in this country. Like because he's from the the projects, he doesn't know what he doesn't know about like the world of wealth, and so he, yeah. he can't even make it happen. He can't make the transition that is easier for somebody who was like more connected. Yeah, and he's clearly like a highly intelligent, like yeah, very good conniving character. But yeah, he's just as you said, doesn't know what he doesn't know. Yeah. Um. Very subtle for The Wire, actually, uh, that whole thing. Yes, but, relatively for them. Yeah, yeah. Omar is a huge breakout character around this season, too. He's, uh, I mean, Omar... he's the Ron Swanson of uh, The Wire, for sure. Oh, my God. That's exactly, exactly what he is. He is the most he epic is. character of The Wire. Omar is a gay guy who frequently robs the Barksdale organization. <laughs> and... Singer, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, fanfare around him. Like he wears this long duster, he whistles "Farmer in the Dell." He he uh, he's fearless. He hates cursing. You know, he uh, is one of those characters in a show, and and they stand out. Are these characters who, in a show that devotes itself to a verite style? I mean, it's not really realistic in any sense, but right, it pre it it presupposes a realistic veneer. It's it is telling you this is like. Things are like this, you know, right, like it's supposed right. to be like that in the Jacob Reese tradition. And then there are some characters who come out and just pop in a way that clearly indicates that this is someone who is being heightened. And that heightenedness always sort of j jumps out from the surroundings. And I guess you could say that you kind of need that. You need some pepper. Yeah, it's TV. You need TV. You need to put some dashes of pepper in there or else you don't get enough. You don't get enough uh, mouthfeel there. And so, yeah, yeah like Brother yeah. Muzon, Brother Muzon's another character. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, there are these characters like Omar and Brother Muzon who are comic book characters. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, I don't think it detracts from, like, it's TV. We've talked about it. We talked about how Deadwood, when it tried to escape the the restraints of TV, that's kind of what killed it. It was yeah. like a dog running into a fucking overcharged electric fence. Yes. The Sopranos is the only show that I feel like kept running up against that line and like running outside of it but it, it's still a tv show yeah it's still on it's it's you're it, never gonna yeah you're never gonna do a good tv show that's and, unrealistic I mean, and it last. is it is like when you want to talk about what kind of show it is what it is at the base when you talk about like fundamental genres of television like the foundational ones that everything is really just building on top of that don't go anywhere it is a cop show Exactly. It's yeah. a cop show, which means not, I'm not even talking about the ideology that it's copaganda or whatever. I am saying that that has a genre element to it. That necessitates a certain trimming away from the realism that they're attempting to portray. 
and towards entertainment. And they're, they're like challenges to sort of ride that line without undermining the under, underlying sense of reality they're trying to promote, which is what like keeps the, the drama intact because you think you're watching something that's really happening. Yeah, yeah. Um, season four is – it's about the Stanfield organization. And Marlo Stanfield, I wouldn't really call him like a comic book character, but he's certainly not – I don't know. He's not – his character is that he has no character. Yeah, but, like, he, he is malice. so. Yeah, exactly. He is like uh, he's so vacant of anything that it feels like he couldn't be real. But honestly, that might be one of the more realistic elements of the show. I I've never really encountered a guy like that, but I right. kind of imagine that if they existed, they would be like him. If a guy comes from nothing yeah. and then comes to command that much fucking power and relishes in his in his ability to command life and death. It would have to be someone who only wanted that. It exactly, be, like totally like, denuded of any exterior uh, 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 shadings of personality or interest. Uh, right. Like the the final, like they 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 show they talk about how like Marlo is the next evolution. He's the more evolved predator, and that and he's the, he's the more evolved predator because he's shorn himself of everything but predation. Yeah, I like so I like that as a character. Again, it's like. There's definitely some liberties taken because it's TV, but I thought that was a good character. But the school, this is where the show got a lot of purchase in liberal culture. And it's because it's like, if you take out the Stanfield storyline, this is like a fucking long form NPR. Yes. Report. Yes. About oh, how bad they the schools are. Oh, God. Do libs love schools and school <laughs> yeah. reform? It's, it's because it's the thing that stands in for the problems we have. Like we have we have material relationships that reproduce all these monstrous inequalities, racial and class based. And there's if there's no changing them, then the only ameliorative function that you can even invest in is to give people the skills to like co cooperate to, to compete in an unfair marketplace. But right. that it's a fantasy. Right, right. It, it's and that's not to say that we're against schools or against yeah, no, high get, quality no, education. No more schools. No more right, schools. Get rid of them. They're schools prisons. Out. They're schools prisons, prisons for kids. Uh, Google Malcolm Malcolm Harris. School, <laughs> schools are prisons. <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, I think I, I, I hate the way that we do education funding in yeah. this country. I think but like the way the, 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 the way they put it, like yeah. the fulcrum it has on the liberal mind yes. is like that's, that's the pivot point of like justice. Like yes. really, beyond exactly. anything else, justice lies in our ability to provide education and so it's a, it's a that is where all the all the like that season is going to be the heart of the show for them and it is i mean that's like what do i think the wires politics are it's like you correctly identify all these problems and horrible conditions and then you're like what if everyone in baltimore got a ba <laughs> fucking what yeah. if man yeah. how would that the fuck are anything? you talking about how, yeah. would that, how would that provide about jobs for the people who have those skills since they're already in it aren't enough for yeah. the people who have them now and that that point of view at best it's naive meritocracy thinking it, it's short-sighted it's idiotic it doesn't take into account into account everything else that keeps poor people poor that keeps the boot on people's necks. And at worst, if you're being the least generous to this point of view, it's like a kind of conservative viewpoint because it's like, Oh, look, well, look, they're killing each other because they don't have any education. Yeah. Oh no. It's, it's like, just pick up, put down the gun and pick up a book. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think that's really what they're saying, but it's like, uh, yeah, I, it's just a very short sighted view. I do think, yeah, obviously it's a huge problem that, Schools are so underfunded and understaffed and like, yeah, they'll be in these old shitty buildings that are like physically too hot or cold for kids to learn. It, it sucks. It's a fucking awful situation for everyone involved, especially the kids. But yeah, no, this is the why this is David Simon pointing you at where we solved the problem. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I just don't agree with him. Um, it's like it's very NPR this season. Yeah, it's like the thing that a sort of like serious set of liberals love, which is like a long, long report about a place you don't live, a place where you don't know anyone that's in America, 
where they talk about how bad it is and you are a better person for learning for ha- having learned that yes vote it's, it's, by the way vote for democrats forever yep uh yep. democrats fucking run this city democrats don't run the state but the you, there's a long tradition in maryland of republicans who received democratic acclaim like larry hogan now the current governor of maryland and it's like it's like yeah fine i mean i don't have any solutions beyond america in sumais importing jean-luc melanchon but if your (laughs) only thing is like oh man look how bad if your only thing is like if your only thing is like look how bad it is vote blue well what the fuck man i mean oh the wire is i've thought about this the wire is the obama of the prestige shows yeah like obama talked about how it was his favorite show and like the Obama approach to politics where you are bearing witness to suffering and trying to ameliorate it on the edges, but have a like bone deep melancholy acceptance of the fundamental intransigence of our social problem. It's and that's what, and that, and that, and if you operate from that, you can do any sort of monstrous, uh, 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 neoliberal austerity. You can preside over, this like backbreaking non-recovery that f- from the 2008 crisis that Obama did, and the whole time think that you're doing good because you have foreclosed to yourself through like consumption of things like the wire, this ritualized uh, uh, um, fatalism that says all you can do is you know get them some books. Yeah, that is something that I think about with the Sopranos a lot is. It's a similar thing because it is a show about how bad everything is and how worse it's going to get. Yep. But it's also like incredibly fun to watch. Yes, exactly. Like it's, it's not, it's you're funny. not trying to bear yeah. witness to anything. You're not building your character by watching it. You're not completing your political uh, education and identity by observing it the way you are with the why. Yeah. Like people, people, it's now hack to talk about, but when people are like, oh, people who watch the Sopranos just because they think the characters are cool. And it's like, Well, that's actually a very high compliment to the show. Yeah, that it's so literary and so well done. But like the characters and writing and directing are so well done that like yeah, your dumbass cousin can be like, oh, this these guys are really funny. Yeah, and also it's like uh, they the only thing that stops you from making that snarky point about the wire is I guess what that they're rooting they think they're cool but they're cops or something because people watch the wire thought people were cool too. Not everybody was doing a goddamn exegesis on the thing. Every show could be interpreted that way. It all depends on how invested you are in the cultural symbolism the show's representing to you. Right. I mean, people love the cop characters. People yeah. love McNulty, the drunk Irish fuck-up Wendell cop. fucking Pierce? They love Wendell Pierce. Violet Hillary, bro. <laughs> Wendell Very Pierce. violent. Sat- uh, well, terrifying Hillary, bro. Yeah. Yeah. Lester Freeman? Uh, yeah, no, yeah, they're all, like, the only realistic cops in the show are the Pollocks. It's yes. like, uh... Yeah, Voight, Val- uh, Volchek. Valchek. Valchek. I, Valchek. I love Valchek. <laughs> I love, I love Commander Valchek. Oh, he, Valchek's <laughs> rules. <laughs> He's Stevenors. I mean, they ain't got but a hundred guys left, Panthus. Yeah, I, like, He doesn't even have a Baltimore accent, but it rules anyway. Right, well, that's, like, I mean, I guess, going back a little bit, Season two is about Commander Valtrax and how he's having a pissing contest with the the head of the Stevedores yep. over who bought the the, who bought the stained glass yes. from the Polish Catholic Church yep. in Baltimore, and it's like that is the only time where they've like gotten what cops are like. Yes. Yep. Just it's, a fucking dumbass. <laughs> just dumb, like the third son of a Polish family. Yep. And totally, like just a persnickety bitch, completely obsessed with like their own advancements, but also too lazy to really pursue it that strongly. Just the, just the American lumpen uh, fucking authority figure. Yeah. And then, uh, Prez Belusky, because he, he alters the trigger stop on his Glock 17 and he makes it so light that he almost, fu- he accidentally busts a fucking round into a plaster wall <laughs> and the police station almost kills somebody and then accidentally like blind some kid. And it's like, yeah, no, that's what one of those guys is like. Yes, Presbo as a cop was very realistic. Pr- the way he turned into uh, Mr. Chips. Oh god. Not yeah. very realistic. I yeah, mean, a I guess, Polish cop yeah. would you like he he wouldn't just be 
fun. Like, he's not the worst thing you could unleash on a classroom. Yeah, like, I guess the idea is that, well, he only acted that way because he really wanted to be a teacher, and he was overcompensating for his for his fear. Basically, he was too much of a beta to be a real fucking, like, piece of shit cop. Yeah, that's the thing, though. There are piece of shit cops in the show, and it's bunk, and it's McNulty, but they are portrayed as cool and wanting to make a difference. They're natural-born police, Felix. Yeah, exa- which is like, uh, yeah. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, McNulty's accent. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. <laughs> Have you seen? It's fucking cracks it's half the time wild. in season one. I I, mean, the first scene with come McNulty. On, come on, mate. Come on. Lay off. Yeah, the first scene with McNulty where he's talking to Rawls. I thought he was going to ask Rawls where his poppy was. Yep. <laughs> Oi, mate. Where's your lady poppy, mate? Remember the falling. License? Right. I'm you right. remember the falling, you cut, right? You show some bloody class. You show but some there's, class. <laughs> there's a there's this scene where he's arguing with that uh, ADA who he fucks for some of the show. Yeah. Who C- Cedric Daniels ends up with. Yes. Uh, and he's like, he gets so pissed and then he's ranting to her about uh, someone getting off and he's like oh so everybody gets paid everyone goes <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> everyone gets paid everyone gets a, a tuppence <laughs> everyone gets a tuppence and a um, leg of mutton everyone <laughs> everyone chim- swings the chimney <laughs> well I guess I'm just fucking Wayne Rooney then <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm up the apples and pears and I <laughs> it's it's like, like it would have been a better show would have just, like, made him inexplicably English. Like, if I'm directing yeah. that Hello, show... I'm over here from the Old Blighty on a police exchange program with the Port of PD. Cheerio. If I'm, if I'm directing the show, first of all, it's terrible uh, if I do it. But I do one good thing. And that good thing is there's just this it, gooner who uh, works with Port PD. Life, mate, I'm a gooner for life. Never explained. Oh, well, yeah, they don't, even, like, they don't even say anything about it. It's like, all right, mate. Right here. These box tail coats, they going down, right? Yeah. They're going down, right? I'll be down to play. I would, I would make it, like, more ridiculous as it went on. Like, I would make it, like, Black Adder. Like, they're going to raid the box tails, and I would have them put on a suit of armor. <laughs> with, like, with, like, <laughs> he rides in sword. with a lance to bust yeah. the door down? <laughs> I would make the dumbest show ever, but I think that would be a breakout character. Just aging him back a hundred years every season. Like, he's, he's he's just dressed up like one of Cromwell's generals. <laughs> he's, got, he's a roundhead. <laughs> yeah. He's got a matchstick rifle. That would be, that would be like a little fun. Yeah, That'd yeah. Be, like, he, if, he comes out with the big neck ruffle. <laughs> yeah. Looks like Sir Walter Raleigh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He just lives in like 1600s England. That would be cool. Like, why did yes, they he, pick him? They didn't have, I mean, he's fine. He does yeah. the job, but I really, I wonder if there isn't a version of this where they get a guy who's like momentarily convincing in the role. And it might add a little bump thing. I don't know. Or maybe it's, like it, it needs to feel like weirdly fake. I don't know. I don't. Yeah. It's like after the first, if he, his accent breaks in the first scene he's ever in. Yeah. You're at no point like, all right, we have to like, we have to like get you accent coaching yeah. or we got to do something. They just man. let it roll. <laughs> they just didn't give a fuck. That is. Yeah. But um, no. Yeah. They all. Like we are kind of supposed to root for the cops. One hundred percent. Like you can yeah. say it's complicated, and it is. And but you know, I mean, author, I know author is dead and everything, but the intention of the program is very clear. Uh, I mean, it, Simon's breakthrough book was Homicide, and it was him working with these uh, uh, PD guys in the Homicide Division for a whole year. And then they made a show out of it, and he wrote it, co-wrote it with a guy who was in the Baltimore Police Department for years. And they, there's cops on the show. He clearly thinks like policing is fine. And the thing is, is that there's nothing necessarily you know horrible with that, but it's an animating principle that has to be acknowledged about the show. Right. That's what makes it so interesting in its con- in its context in modern liberalism. It. it- it's like that alone makes it dated because you couldn't make a show that's like for liberals 
right. just like this. Yeah, now. exactly. Because that liberal that liberal sense of like, well, there's good cops or whatever. It's getting unsettled. It's like police, right. police, like you know, everything is getting si- sifted by in the ga- great cultural you know divide that we're getting. You know, like there's this slow process whereby every element of our culture is going to get so- sorted in through the political you know machine and shoot it into uh, based or cringe or whatever yeah. the fuck. And uh, for liberals, at this point, we're in the process of just the very concept of cops becoming cringe. I mean, my God, they, the whole cast of Brooklyn Nine-Nine had to get on their fucking knees oh, on broken God. glass to apologize for perpetuating uh, copaganda. I mean, it's an absurd thing. Yeah, it's like People a like whimsical cop comedy There's gonna show. There's going to be cop shows. People like yeah. cop shows. They're in society. They're an element of a capitalist uh, social order. Watch the show. Shut up. But and Also, like, most Democratic voters are fine with yep. cops like i don't necessarily agree with them but yeah the self-conscious liberals who like stuff like the wire and who make taste when it comes to tv would not accept it anymore right right it's exactly. too unstable it's it's clearly like it's jumping through its quantum spa- phasing and it's going to phase over to the republican side and then you're not going to be able to touch it ever again right and then the next cop show is like conservative the wire yeah where it's about like it's about like a cop trying to investigate Obama Gate. <laughs> that would rule. <laughs> That's all right. We're making that show, and one of the characters is English. Yes, Dominic West can come back as Michael Flynn Jr. <laughs> Oi, we've got to get Gulon, bro. <laughs> right. Hey, you're disrespecting the son of a decorated right, army general, mate. <laughs> <laughs> My father fought the round hats for you. But, but, uh, yeah, no, so. Season four, there's like a huge explosion of Omar mythos where he's basically invincible. In yep, four. jumps out a giant window. Yeah. And uh, they insist that uh, that's based on a true thing that happened. But uh, And it might have, but in the context of the character as he already exists, you know, it's, it's, it's just another leveling up into the cartoon world. Right, yeah. There's, um, it's, I would say the season is mostly about the kids. It's about Naaman, Bryce, and Michael, yes. and... I like I thought Michael's storyline was like it was it was interesting like not exactly like new territory but it was like I thought it was well done I thought Naaman's storyline was like it was very NPR though because it's like oh like a like they're going to make him be a drug dealer yeah. but what if we gave him after school programs? Yeah. And then that works, and he's fine, yeah, and he believes yeah, in he's himself. Fucking fine, yeah. You know, as if like like life in a precarious situation like that is not a constant buff, like buffeting of bad things and yeah. unanticipated disasters. But of course, the, I, honestly, they kind of give the game away though, because of the three kids, right, that they follow in that season, Naaman is the one who isn't poor. Yeah, no, yeah, that's so it's like, a great point. He is the only realistic one that you can say, and everything will be fine for him from now on because you got a decent chance that he's going to be buffeted from the worst of living you know, in on those streets, whereas the other kids were doomed. So like, even yeah. in your fantasy of how this works, you get a one out of three chance. It's like, that is terrible odds, dude. Yeah, I mean, they do, yeah, Duquan, who uh, they just, just almost like you can almost describe it. It's sort of for liberals, like what Saw is for stupid people, <laughs> where it's just like, oh, I love seeing the bad thing happen to people because it's bad. Yeah, no, oh like, god, Dookie, the whole thing is you're just supposed to cry. It's it's very much a uh, uh, manipulative. It's it's like it's like something from Dreiser or something. It's yeah. very very like confront. It, it's 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 indulgently melodramatically sad yeah we get to season five which is the fucking worst season oh boy i mean terrible it is interesting to note that in a in a in a space in a deck in an argument online argument of this space as inherently you know disputatious as television studies and how and a place where there's always uh room for a contrarian take to spark a day's worth of distraction from one's life uh you've almost never see fifth season wire apologia like the second season has a lot of uh uh uh, defenders as you said some people say actually it's the best i don't think there's anybody who says that about the fifth season i think the best you can get out of people is 
it's not as bad as some people say it is. Yeah. This season is like, you know how you know it's bad? It's about journalists and no journalist likes it. Yeah. And those people love being the center of attention. Yeah. It doesn't even matter if you make a thing that's like a, a movie or something that's critical of journalists. They just love talking. Oh, they about love talking about, thinking themselves. about themselves. Oh, yeah. And, and even they, they were like, <laughs> yeah. I think it's because yeah. honestly, it's like, oh, this isn't actually about like journalists. This, even though it's very, uh, it's not that it's like, oh, these are hard truths. It's that the the author revealed himself exactly, and they were exactly. they saw what they were, and they were disgusted by it as they should right. have been. We're we're cringe. Well, yeah. David Simon is a deeply cringe man. One of the cringiest cringers who's ever cringed. If you just go to David Simon's timeline right now, on the day you're listening to this listener. And you're going to find him using compound swears that should have never made it out of 2003. He's the Whedon-eskest motherfucker on there. Yeah, like he's like a typical David Simon post. It'll be like a link to a John Ossoff fundraiser. And it'll be like the fuck popples in the Republican Senate caucus don't give a truffle fuck <laughs> about the shit apocalypse that's coming if we don't get if we don't get a majority. So show them the what the fuck for. And yes, I said fuck popple. And it's and it's like one trillion retweets. Yep. Everyone on the planet retweeted it. <laughs> the girl you have a crush on retweeted it. Your girl on your crush on <laughs> retweeted David Simon and it's David like, Simon oh, fucked her. <laughs> no, dude, don't do this. David Simon fucked her and they both came and he said, Oh shit. Shit, Romulus in the in the in the in the fuckropolis of Greece. I'm going mother, to mother bitch. I'm going to look at his. Uh, here we go. I'm looking at his timeline right now. Oh. This is a random sampling. I don't miss Trump. That shit bag can golf his way to oblivion and the inauguration for all I care. But it's been a few days since Rudy Giuliani delivered a moral and strategic pratfall so ridiculous that it slacks our collective jaw. And yes, I am secretly ready for more. God, God damn, that was damn. just the top tweet. That was, that was so perfectly terrible. <laughs> I was like, there's no way this is going to be good enough. I'm probably going to have to cut it. <laughs> Jesus. Yes, Bobby, I'll have some more Pratt Falls, please. Oh, God. <laughs> but, like, people I'm love putting it. my resting big face on when I look at that mango Mussolini. <laughs> yeah, he's liberal lector. He is That's liberal lector, R.I.P. R.I.P. to a king. He's like, yeah, and he. it's not that he's an epic resistance post. Like, he's always. Posted. Always like that. During Obama, he would post like that. Yep. Like, yeah, he was there arguing Bush, with people probably. who thought that Obama wasn't doing enough. Like, how about you be president, huh, smart guy? It's like, good point, man. I can see why The Wire was so politically astute. Yeah. But and that's not to say David Simon's like a shitty writer. His shows suck. No, his it's shows just, are like, good just because he yeah, has he, these cringy things. Cringe is part of art, man. If you yeah. cringeless art is not art. That's what the, art, that's the juice. Yeah. Cringeless art is just detached, disembodied like irony yeah. and like a slight flavor of affectation. It yeah. sucks. Absolutely need, garbage. Even David Chase is cringe. Everyone's cringe. Everyone's got to be a little cringe cuz otherwise you're not risking anything. Exactly. You don't have the emotional weight behind yep. anything cuz you don't care about anything. Caring is cringe, so we're all cringe. But David Simon is the most cringe. Oh, yes. And it's like, we all need some, and it's all about how you add mix it into the rest of your repertoire of expression. And on paper and behind the camera, he's his cringe, it's still there. Oh, it, you can see it. it oh, swaths. fuck yeah, you can but see it. But it's it. it's adulterated, and there's other stuff. In the, in the mere, you know, skeleton of Twitter conversation, it's just pure cringe. And the thing is, is that that's because... You should not experience artists this way. Exactly. You should yeah. not experience artists of any kind in this way. And it, like the show, it's not aged well for a number of reasons we're discussing, but it has real qualities to it that I'm afraid people are just going to ignore because, oh, he's cringe. It's like, yes, but no one should be doing this. No one, no real artist should be on Twitter with their fucking thoughts out there every day. You're supposed to filter that shit. Through like the a, the abstracting apparatus of creating a plot and characters and things like that. And though I think one of the worst things that happened to art in the last twenty years is audience feedback. Oh God, yeah. miserable! The fucking I got the it, 
the, as the like you have an explosion of a uh, real uh, uh, like real cultural ferment with the advent of uh, prestige TV, right? Like, okay, television is a more artistically adulterated medium than others, but it's also so ubiquitous that you know you could really challenge boundaries here. But then almost immediately, the the, the trajectory of like art and television was completely arrested uh, by the emergence of fucking a blog culture around TV shows, recaps. Yes. Fucking television with foul pity in the AV club created this meta narrative about shows where all of a sudden, instead of like putting out a, a season of television where you have a creative vision behind it, you're week by week getting this like audience uh, feedback, this like uh, this focus group that is going, how does it not like infect your understanding of what you're doing? Right. And I think it's sort of, it's perfect because The Wire is the most dated of the big three or four, if you want to include like Breaking Bad or whatever you want to do, whatever right. your big three are. Mad, uh, Mad, three. Mad Men, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. But it's the most dated because it was written for the most current issue. Yep. And it was not written to be about existential things, which is fine. Not every show has to be about existential things. Like Justified certainly isn't. I love that show. But, uh, it's about things that were like very important to online liberals, you know, early blog sphere liberals in like 2003. Yep. And so it's going to, it's going to, for the first 10 years after it, yeah, people are still going to watch it. But like, it, it, sit down like a 19 year old from Twitter who's really annoying now and like make them watch this. And it's like, they'll fucking hate it. They'll scream their heads off. Uh, because A, as we talked about, like the liberal needle has moved. But B, like, yeah, a lot of things are, once you get 10 years outside of its creation point, it's completely foreign to you. If you don't have that context, like, we're only able to still like this, I think, because of that context. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and it is trying to, it, it's actually fascinating to think about how The Wire is, it's like, okay, you have this thing, prestige television, long-form storytelling on TV. Who are we going to have do something? Here's this guy who's who has tried to, you know, uh, express the reality of urban crime to an audience, both through journalism and through art for his whole career. We're going to give him money and a place to fucking put it together. And what he puts out is the product is the product of a thoroughly, a thoroughly uh, capitalist middle class, like manufactured consent. Not at the, like like the fact. David Simon is a good liberal. Yeah. And the, and the show is made by good liberals. And so they give him the, the canvas. And what does he want to tell us? He wants to tell us this is what's really happening with crime and then what to do about it. And so the first season establishes the horror of the drug war and the sterile pointlessness of the drug war and the need for it to be transcended. Now, the second season, this is the season that actually addresses class the way that they do address class, even if you do go to college and get a lot of, you know, uh, liberalism you also do get a recognition of how like real exploitation exists and so that season exists to tell you yeah this is actually why this is all happening the real reason all this is happening is because the money's going away and people as li lives are ruled by despair and and the state exists has to uh like cage them to 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 prevent them from just you know becoming antisocial. and but that season does ends with uh no hope like that's a season where Frank Sabatka dies. They they close up the local. Everyone gets drunk. It's the Springsteen nihilist ending. But then, from that base, the next three seasons are actually prescriptive. Okay, yes. we can't do anything about the base of this. But what can we do for these symptoms? We could uh, decriminalize drugs. We could right. reform education. And we could get better media. And that is the liberal pitch. That's the Obama neoliberal response to the crisis of capitalism in the 21st century is in that span of five seasons uh, of The Wire. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. And because all those seasons were hyper-reactive to things that were written, to things that were in an 18th month space around its writing, uh, I think this is its legacy. That's yeah. how every show is done. Yeah, exactly. And so they're they're stunted in that same way. And and worse now because like the schmo the cringe has to go up because we have to d respond to a more frankly hysterical political environment. 
this where, is, where the need to like yeah. address everything is much heavier on uh, a given show than it was then. This is why I think art generally gets worse under Republicans now. The more powerful Republicans get, the shittier art gets. Because, like, things started taking a downswing during that huge Tea Party swing in 2014. Yes. Like, I know 2010 was technically a bigger slaughter, but 2014, I think, is when, like, Hollywood liberals and stuff were like, ooh, ooh. We're, in, like, we're locked in here with them. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I think, like, the more hopeless it gets politically for liberals, they're not hopeless, but, like, dire. They're not winning. Uh, the more that the art has to represent the urgency of the moment. And that's horrible for art. It's horrible for it. Just like audience feedback is horrible for it. Yeah. Anything where you instantly put it out and instantly get something back is going to suck shit. Do you think any, like, it creates the the shortest shelf life for art? Like, do you think anyone, things made during the Trump administration that are broadly reflective of social trends the last four years, do you think a lot of people are going to go back and watch them? Yeah. Oh God, no! Everything that's on the the every show that's on the wire model is just a, a further we copy another Michael Keaton from the Michael uh, Multiplicity Machine, uh, and so people just are going to keep going back to the wire, which means that brace yourself. There's probably going to be, especially with Biden in there, and that sort of like learned helplessness, liberal response to nothing ever getting better. You might see a, uh, a a renewal of interest in the wire, and we might end up getting a wave of wire based uh, memes among our blue checked media class. Oh God! Like av after an epic quote tweet dunk on Donald Trump Jr. Yeah, it's all in the game, yo. Oh, oh yeah, not good. Oh, oh. I think I think like for the hopes of art, for the hopes of something like a Tropic Thunder happening again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Joe, should have done better down ballot, man. Yeah, he really blew it. Yeah, he blew it, pal. Gonna be, every, nothing's going to happen, so everyone's going to be just on this tender hook. Uh, you, they needed a nice sits bath with uh, with like a big margin so they could just kind of cool for like three months before they got back into it. But no, it's, it's going to be, it's, they're going to keep doing it. So I want to close out with this. The Wire has. One David Simon's vision of TV has won. This type of TV has won. This is what all, pretty much all prestige shows are going to be like. Like you know the like I like the boys a lot, but yeah. it's also about everything now. Apps. Oh, so much. It's like I could just what read Twitter, man. I don't actually have to watch this show. Yeah. So, what would it take for something to not be like that? For something to be like Sopranos or Deadwood? Or Breaking Bad. Or I whatever. think it Something would have. Yeah. It would have to come orthogonally to all the current cultural signifiers. So, like, it could not be. Uh, uh, man, I don't know. I, I think for one thing is it would have to. I would think. God, I, I honestly can't even think of something that could come out of the current, like, incentive structure we have that could fit the bill because you're not going to even get. It's not going to be incentivized. Uh, capitalistically unless yeah, there's a guaranteed response and what w gets responses now is we've been conditioned really and I don't know if anything that comes out that's not like that would work like I uh, I really loved Lodge 49 I don't know if you've watched that show I've uh, heard great things about I it I loved it uh, and like these days every show gets three fucking seasons three seasons that might be all it gets like apparently Netflix has an algorithm that tells them that you never. There's no point of having any show go for more than three seasons because people don't keep subscribe. At that point, no one knew subscribing to watch it, so that's fine. But it only got two, and it only got fucking two, and it felt left me just feeling so bereft, much like Deadwood getting prematurely uh, canceled. And and I really feel like in their case, they could have they could have really they could have brought it all home with one more year, and. I think a lot of it comes down to the fact that it did not push the right buttons culturally to get people to pick care about it because it's yeah and and I don't know if anything can I think I'm racking my brain thinking of like 
outside of ridiculous scenarios like Bernie winning with a super majority of Bernie crats or, uh, you know, uh, uh, we're taken over by some other country and then we have a sovereign wealth fund and we the arts become more accessible for people that didn't go to NYU. Yeah. These ridiculous things that won't happen. Uh, the only thing I could think about is if you were getting creative, if you pitched something, you sort of lied and you were like, this is for conservatives. Yeah. It, none of that politics. Shit is in it. Yep. And it could be, you know, you could have politics stuff in it because you can't make something that is totally bereft of the current moment because it's just by the act of you living as a person. Now, yeah, it's, it's going, going to, to be some imbued. reflection. It's going to be imbued. But I'm saying, you know, there won't be a character who walks around like calling things fake news. Oh, God. I hope like, not. like, like that, like nothing like that. But if you were like, yeah, this is my my show. This is my show about a cool guy in the military for, you know, the Trump TV network or something. And then you could make like, you know, you you know, we always talked about our idea for the America, the real American sniper movie. Oh yeah, about Chris Kyle, the habitual liar, and you could make this great fucking thing about, uh, you know, lying as part of American identity. You know, uh, yeah, you know, I think what you'd have to do is you would have to throw out the rule book. You'd essentially have to see take like. Do a thorough analysis of what has become the received language now of of quality television and just do the opposite of all of it. Yeah. It would have to just be heightened to such an extent that it would clash with its surroundings enough that it would gain attention just by sheer charisma. Yeah. Something and, garish and horrifying. And you would need an otherworldly charismatic lead and... Gandolfini and Hoffman are dead. God, uh, God, the one man who could have saved Prestige TV is probably Philip Seymour fucking Hoffman. God damn. Yeah. Well, here we are. And yet, here we are. Oh, well. This is a very bad world to live in, but again, feel lucky that The Wire didn't come on in the last yeah, four years. Yeah, really and dodged you, the bullet. You missed a lot of cringe posts. Yep. Uh, well, uh, it looks like he took, gave a fuck when it wasn't his turn to give a fuck. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, well, we dodged a bullet on that one. For now. We'll see now. We'll see if yeah. the cycle comes back and they all start but, rewatching it together. Because remember, Sopranos had that big, like, there was that cycle where everybody was rewatching the Sopranos, I think, like, six yeah. months ago. If that happens, and then there was all the Sopranos memes. If that yeah. happens, if that's the next wave, ooh, Katie barred the door. It's going to be it's gonna be ill sailing on the, the information <laughs> uh, superhighways. I will suddenly become, like, a censor of the internet guy if that happens. Yeah. Pull the plug. I'm gonna, yeah, Pull yeah, the I'll plug. Like, this is unsafe. <laughs> it's unacceptable. Yep. Well, we hate to end on a depressing note, but how else are you going to end it? It's true. I'm Felix Peterman. I'm Matt Christmas. See you next time. <laughs>